Hi, this is Ohio Nursing Home Abuse Lawyer William Eady. I'm going to answer the question I get all too often, which is why does it seem like no lawyers will take my case for a loved one in a nursing home who's experienced abuse or neglect, but they're still alive? Uh, and I'll tell you, this is a question I get a lot. We're very selective in the cases we take. We're not able to take cases even when we think there's been bad care. And the question today comes from a new group in Ohio that I think is doing great things They're called Elderly Advocates. They have a great active Facebook group. I recommend you go check them out. So why is it that it seems like lawyers won't take particular cases? So I can only speak for myself and my law firm. We focus on nursing home abuse and neglect cases. Most personal injury lawyers don't. So I, I think they're, you know, one problem is that for lawyers who don't handle these kinds of cases and they treat them like personal injury cases, they don't understand that older life has a lot of value. They're used to kind of evaluating things as the younger you are when you're injured, the higher the value of your claim. They don't think about, well, when you're older, dignity is so important, how you end your life, how your life ends is so important. The time you have left is so precious that, that they, they may undervalue the cases somewhat. But I'm gonna restrict my comments today to the six reasons that our firm is often not able to take cases that we'd otherwise like to take. So number one, and this is a huge one, really tragic one is tort reform, quote unquote reform. And tort reform is a, a 30, 40 year long project by the insurance industry to convince the public and doctors and healthcare providers that evil plaintiffs and evil plaintiffs lawyers are creating catastrophes. They're making medicine more expensive. They're making it impossible to find doctors. They're running doctors out of town. They're winning these big jackpot justice verdicts. All of that, and I'll just tell you, is a lie. It's statistically wrong. It's been proven wrong. I posted an article a little bit, a little while ago that, that they've done multiple studies that have shown that in fact, Tort reform doesn't help anybody. It actually makes care worse. It leads to more deaths and more problems. So huge issue there. Uh, number two, and this kind of explains why tort reform does such a, such a number on us, are damage caps. So tort reform generally is making it harder to file lawsuits. You have less time to file lawsuits called the statute of limitations. They just really make it harder on lawyers and injured people to get justice. And that's the whole job. The, the big thing, though, are damage caps. So in some states, and Ohio is one of them, they limit the amount that can be awarded for pain and suffering. So as agonizing as some of these things can be, terrible bed sores, dying uh, in an infected haze because or starving to death or um, dehydrating to death, as terrible as that is, and a jury of, of citizens, of your peers, who come in and say, that's wrong, here's what you should get for that. Here's what a fair amount is for that. Well, the, the tort reform says, no, now the judge is compelled to ignore what the jury said and arbitrarily reduce that to a set number. And one of the worst examples of this was in Texas. And if you look at Texas, it's now either the 49th or the fifth, 50th worst state for nursing home care, mainly because of damage caps and tort reform. So it's just a terrible idea. And, and it means that these cases that can cost many tens of thousands of dollars to bring to the point of trial, because of these arbitrary limits, it is impossible for the families or the lawyers to make good decisions about pursuing cases where the damages are gonna be capped so low or to take on a number of these cases. Whereas before the defendants would say, gee, this was really bad care. This might upset some people. There might be punitive damages. There might be all these issues. We should resolve this case fairly now they're saying, well, we're not exposed to that risk. So these insurance companies and, and uh, nursing homes are saying, nah, forget about that. We'll just make this as expensive as possible and the lawyers aren't gonna be able to afford to take the cases. Now we take on cases that, that may be at risk for that, but there's only so many you can take on. And so it leads to people not being able to find lawyers. And that's the idea. That's the idea is to take away your rights to proceed uh, to get justice. Number three are limits on medicine and causation. So you don't just have to prove bad care. You have to prove that that specific bad care caused specific harms or deaths. And that's not always possible. Sometimes it's not possible because we just haven't learned enough about the human body to connect it. Sometimes the evidence isn't there. Uh, sometimes you need an autopsy to prove that and an autopsy wasn't performed, which is a whole separate issue. Uh, and that make, can make cases where we know there's bad care, but we can't do anything about it. Uh, 
the other thing that's so important here, and this is the fourth issue, is that the state should really be filling that gap. So federal government has all these regulations, Medicare, and then Medicaid or the Department of Health and Human Services at the states are the ones to actually investigate for issues. And they are wildly underfunded in many states, understaffed. They have to, you know, and Ohio has almost 10,000 nursing homes. Every single one of them has to be inspected almost once a year. To add on to that, to inspect and investigate specific cases of neglect and malfeasance, they're not able to do that the way I wish they could. So where you have these cases that don't quite get to the point where they should be a civil lawsuit, but still have bad care, there's kind of this donut hole here the state should be filling uh, because they have the authority to go in without a subpoena, without filing a lawsuit, without all these other things and make people sit down for interviews, inspect records and do all that. And I just don't think they, they can. So I see a lot of cases where they really ought to be citing nursing homes and they don't. They, they don't substantiate it really is meaningless. It just means that they chose not to do something. And I don't always blame the investigators. Sometimes it feels like they let the family down a little bit, but I, I just got to think they're not getting the staffing and funding they need to really turn over every rock like we would hope they would. And, and that's something I think we should change. So number five, I think this relates back to the efforts, the 30 to 40 years of efforts in tort reform, convincing doctors in the medical profession that lawyers and plaintiffs are their enemy. Uh, we don't get a lot of cooperation from treating physicians. So the people who know these patients the best, the people who, who receive them at the hospital and say, boy, this is neglect. This, this never should have been this way. They're starving this person. They're dehydrating this person. They tell the family that. But when it comes time for a lawsuit, they really tighten up. They don't want to be involved. They're worried about how their peers will respond to that. So it's only in the worst cases that we get a lot of cooperation. I think that's a shame. There used to be an ethical guideline for doctors that said they have to participate morally and ethically in their patients' legal medical issues. Why is that? Well, I, it doesn't matter what I think about care. Only a doctor or an expert can testify about particular types of care and whether it didn't meet the standards, whether it was negligent. And to have treating physicians not participate means we're forced to always rely on expensive, out-of-town paid experts who aren't always believed and the other side gets their own paid experts who really ought not to be believed too much of the time, but you know they come in and, and then the, the jury says, well, we got paid people over here, paid people over here, they don't agree. I guess it's a draw so the plaintiff loses. Whereas if the treating physicians came in and really were as candid uh, in our cases as they are to the family, the jury would say, oh, well, obviously this person, person knows and there's bad care. So it really makes it hard when we don't have that type of cooperation. I don't I don't really blame the physicians for kind of buying into that. I think it's an easy mistake to make, but I do blame the insurance industry for creating this climate. And the, you know, I, we say as much as we can, we're not enemies of physicians and nurses uh, and aides. We're enemies of the corporate culture of greed and understaffing at nursing homes. And often the nurses and aides are just as much victims as everyone else. Uh, and then finally, number six, and this is one that's really personal to us, confidentiality agreements and low settlements by other lawyers. It just becomes such a problem when insurance companies and defendant nursing homes can say, well, these cases are only worth this much. And you don't know that what other lawyers are settling for because they're all agreeing to confidentiality. 100% of my clients who come talk to me, they're not worried about the money, although money is one way to drive corporate accountability. It's hard to be greedy and let people die when you end up having to pay for that. But what they really want out is accountability and helping to prevent this from happening to other people. One of the main ways to do that is to make sure that people can look up information and learn about what's going on in these nursing homes. That, that's such an important part of this. And when lawyers just kind of agree to confidentiality, which, which we never recommend to our clients, I think that undermines the public's ability to know what's going on in our public justice system. So those are my six thoughts on why it can be difficult for lawyers even lawyers who, special, who, who focus on nursing home abuse like we do to take all the cases they wish they could take. It's unfortunate. And I, I really think some of these are things we can fix if we come together. And I hope that groups like elderly advocates and other groups out there, uh, AARP and other folks like that can really help us make some changes to, to help increase and improve the care in nursing homes. Let me know what you think in the comments, like and share with these people who need to see this. And I appreciate your time. Thanks.